So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We will get started with our introductory session to this fifth EU Nonproliferation and Disarmament Conference. Uh, Jacek, could you get us started, please? Yes. Uh, good morning, uh, dear colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen. For those I have not yet had the privilege of meeting in person, uh, my name is Jacek Belica, and I am the special envoy for disarmament and nonproliferation at the European External Action Service uh, based here in Brussels. And this is the fifth EU Nonproliferation and Disarmament Conference, supported by the European Union and organized by the EU Nonproliferation Consortium of Think Tanks, represented here on stage by Mark Fitzpatrick. The European Union has a rich history of supporting disarmament and nonproliferation of both conventional weapons and weapons of mass destruction and their means of delivery. In recent years, thousands of tons of anti-personal mines, small arms and light weapons, chemical weapons, and other deadly tools of war have been destroyed thanks to the funds provided by the EU. Thousands of experts around the world have been trained thanks to our capacity building efforts. Hundreds of diplomatic demarches have been delivered by the EU to promote the universalization and effective implementation of international disarmament and non-proliferation treaties and conventions. Tens of millions of euros have been provided to the international organizations supporting these treaties. Strongly supporting civil society's involvement and NGOs working in this field, the EU established in 2010 the EU Nonproliferation Consortium. It connects together and supports a number of independent think tanks across Europe working on a broad range of topics related to disarmament, nonproliferation, and arms export control. You are participating in the consortium's largest annual event with circa 300 participants coming from over 60 countries and organizations. But it is also good to be aware of the consortium numerous other activities. They include smaller topical seminars on current issues, most recently, for example, on the DPRK organized in Seoul, it involves an internship program or specialized publications which are available online at www.nonproliferation.eu. All these political, diplomatic, financial, academic, and technical efforts are guided by our strategic documents approved by all EU member states. For example, in 2003, the EU adopted a strategy against proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, and in 2004, a strategy to combat illicit accumulation and trafficking of small arms and light weapons and their ammunition. The new EU global strategy, unveiled earlier this year in June, confirmed that, and I quote, the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and their delivery systems remains a growing threat to Europe and the wider world. The EU will strongly support the expanding membership, universalization, full implementation and enforcement of multilateral disarmament, non-proliferation and arms control treaties and regimes. We will use every means at our disposal to assist in resolving proliferation crisis as we successfully did on the Iranian nuclear program. The EU will actively participate in export control regimes, strengthen common rules governing member states' export policies of military, including dual-use equipment and technologies, and support export control authorities in third countries and technical bodies that sustain arms control regimes." End of quote. In our disarmament and non-proliferation activities, we also enjoy support from the European Parliament, which, for example, just last month passed a new resolution on nuclear issues, to which we will have an opportunity to refer in more detail uh, in the next session. We are also very proud and honored to work under the leadership of the EU High Representative for Foreign and Security Policy, 
who herself has a very rich background in disarmament and non-proliferation issues and takes a strong interest in them. Federica Mogherini, even in her previous parliamentarian and ministerial positions, participated in the work of the European Leadership Network for Multilateral Nuclear Disarmament and Non-Proliferation, the ELN, the Parliamentarians for Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament, PNND, as well as the group of eminent persons in support of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, the CTBT GEM. Unfortunately, due to numerous other duties, she could not be with us today, but before uh, leaving for, I believe, Latin America, the High Representative recorded a video message to the participants of this conference, and I hope that, thanks to the marvels of, well, 20th century technology, we will be able to see it right now. Dear friends, I'm truly sorry I cannot be there with you today. You all know that over the last few years, non-proliferation and disarmament have been at the core of the European Union's foreign policy and of my daily work. We've contributed to great success stories, but we've also witnessed some serious setbacks and the emergence of new threats. When new obstacles arise and the international environment becomes more confrontational, that's precisely the moment when we cannot afford to just sit and wait. So today, it is even more important to look for new solutions, new initiatives, new pathways towards a more peaceful global order. This is what our global strategy means when it talks about widening the system of global governance. We're working constantly to implement existing treaties on non-proliferation and disarmament and to expand their membership. But we also need to tackle proliferation crises when they arise, seeking creative solutions and investing in multilateral formats, exactly as we did with Iran. Last time I addressed this conference, our deal with Iran had just been reached. And many were still skeptical that the deal could ever be fully implemented. But over the past year, we successfully reached the implementation day. And the ministerial joint commission I chair has confirmed that all sides are sticking to their commitments. For instance, during our last meeting, just last September in New York, and the IA has done the same. It's a major success, but it is not only uh, this, the only success we have. We shipped out of Libya the last chemical weapon precursors, a crucial step for the stability of the country. We have celebrated the 20th anniversary of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty with two new ratifications from Swaziland and Myanmar. At the Nuclear Security Summit organized by President Obama, we agreed on stronger international cooperation against nuclear threats, and particularly with regard to terrorist groups. This is the only approach that can guarantee success. Security from cooperation, security from diplomacy, security from disarmament. And it's the approach we need as the stakes get higher. New chemical attacks took place inside Syria, and for the first time inside a state that is party to the Chemical Weapons Convention. North Korea carried out new nuclear tests following an unprecedented campaign of ballistic missile launches. The European Union, you know that, is imposing autonomous restrictive measures against North Korea's nuclear program. But we all know also that to stop Pyongyang's nuclear ambitions, we also need diplomacy. DPRK has to re-engage constructively with the international community. And for this to happen, it is vital that all permanent members of the Security Council do their part. Only multilateral diplomacy can stop this escalation. Only multilateral diplomacy can lead to a successful review of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Only multilateral diplomacy could convince countries such as India and Pakistan, or Egypt and Israel, to ratify simultaneously the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. However, we also see global powers threatening to step back from previous agreements. A confrontational posture can do no good. A fragile international environment calls for stronger, not weaker, global governance. It calls for cooperative solutions and for innovative solutions. So to make this possible, we need a constant channel of communication between governments, but also between experts. This is why 
this conference is so important and the research of the EU Non-Proliferation Consortium is so valuable. We need to understand if we want to act well. And we need the best technical expertise if we want diplomats and policymakers to do a good job. So let me wish you a very positive conference. And let me thank you for all we have achieved so far and for everything we will achieve together in the years ahead. Thank you, High Representative. Uh, before I uh, introduce the keynote speaker, let me make uh, three announcements of a, of a technological nature. Um, first, uh, you will have noticed that we are a paperless conference. There are no um, agendas being distributed or um, lists of participants, but you can find all this information uh, on the conference app, which if you haven't downloaded it, uh, you can get assistance in how to download it. Uh, secondly, the sessions here in this room all are being live streamed on the IISS uh, website and uh, will be available uh, for uh, review via YouTube afterwards. The sessions in the simultaneous breakout uh, groups will be um, recorded on audio and will be available uh, later on. Um, secondly, I wanted to uh, encourage tweeting of the uh, conference. The uh, Twitter uh, hashtag is uh, over there, EU Nonprolif. Uh, yeah, and that's my technological announcement. So let me now um, introduce, I'm very pleased to do so, the conference keynote speaker, Mr. Kim Wan-Su, United Nations Under Secretary General and High Representative for Disarmament Affairs, a position he assumed in June 2015. Prior to taking this post, he served as Assistant Secretary General and Special Assistant to UN Secretary General uh, Ban Ki-moon since January 2007. Uh, some said he was Ban's uh, key right-hand man. He's an exceptionally able uh, right hand, if I may say. He previously served as a diplomat for the Republic of Korea for over 37 years with a variety of bilateral and multilateral assignments in key positions, including uh, an ambassadorial title. In his UN role, Mr. Uh, Kim Won Su has been involved in many of the issues that will be explored in this conference. He has led efforts to investigate chemical weapon attacks in Syria and to dismantle the chemical weapons stockpile. In a recent address marking both the 70th anniversary of the UN and the 70th anniversary of the first and last use of nuclear weapons in war, Mr. Kim outlined goals to address the issue of nuclear disarmament as well as sustainable development related to climate concerns. With regard to North Korea, he has insisted that provocations be stopped, but he also said the United Nations should leave a door open should the North Korean position change. But I should let him express uh, all these views uh, in his own words on these matters. So, Mr. Kim, um, I invite you to the podium. Yasek uh, Blitzer, Principal Advisor and Special Envoy for Non-Proliferation and Disarmament of the European Union. Mr. Mark Fitzpatrick, Director, Non-Proliferation and Nuclear Policy Program of IISS. Excellencies, friends, ladies and gentlemen, it was so good to see so many familiar faces in this room, including a couple of my distinguished predecessors, Sergio and Angela. <laughs> I, I'm truly impressed by the convening powers of uh, Yasek and Mark. And uh, uh, thanks for also a very uh, generous introduction of, about me. At the outset, I'd like to uh, convey the warmest Greetings uh, from the Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, to all of you. He wishes uh, for a very fruitful uh, conference. And also, I must thank the European Union Non-Proliferation Consortium to invite me to speak today. Each of your four institutions continues to make 
a real contribution to the cause of a safer and more prosperous world. I would be remiss if I don't thank the European Union and its member states for their strong and generous support to the United Nations Office for Disarmament Affairs. Without your generosity, we would find it difficult to accomplish our broad mandate. EU donations have helped build the universalization and enhance the practical implementation of disarmament and non-proliferation commitments. EU finds our programs uh, crucial uh, to achieving a world uh, safer, more secure, and better for all. And EU funds have supported capacity building and technical assistance and raised public awareness across the entire spectrum of our activities. While I, of course, wish to thank you for your partnership and support, today I want to go a step further. This year marks a number of anniversaries in disarmament and non-proliferation. 71 years of uh, first and last use of nuclear weapons, uh, as Mark said, this year also marks a 70th anniversary of the first ever resolution adopted by the UN General Assembly, which is about eliminating uh, atomic weapons and weapons adaptable to uh, mass destruction. It is also the 20th anniversary, as uh, uh, High Representative uh, Mogherini said, of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. But it is not a cause for celebration, but a sober reminder of the job unfinished. It has also been 30 years since the historic summit at Lake Havik uh, between the United States and the former Soviet Union a turning point in the nuclear arms race. European Union member states have made tremendous contributions to all of these milestones. I also want to underscore the tremendous contributions of the governments and citizens in this great region to the United Nations, to multilateralism, to international peace and security, and to the rule of law living together on a continent that suffered two devastating world wars. You can certainly speak with certain authority about the horrible consequences for humanity of that nightmare we call total war. During your recovery from these tragedies, you have established and maintained an absolutely indispensable role in world affairs as a bridge builder in times of great political divisions. You mediated between the two nuclear superpowers during the darkest days of the Cold War and pioneered bold diplomatic approaches of peace, security, and reconciliation with some of your finest achievements in the fields of Detente and the spirit of Helsinki. Your bridge building has helped not just to improve East-West relations, but also to strengthen North-South relations, not to mention your work in building bridges to link all countries behind some fundamental global public goods like protecting the environment, defending human rights, and advancing sustainable development. This bridge building spirit was evident during many recent disarmament initiatives, including the Hale Code of Conduct on ballistic missiles, the Arms Trade Treaty, and efforts to develop a Code of Conduct for the peaceful use of outer space. It was mostly most recently displayed in the role the European Union played in finding a diplomatic solution to the Iran's nuclear program. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we need 
this spirit today more than ever. It is given greater urgency by a growing nexus of security threats. They are tapestry of entrenched and emerging threats that is the product of globalization and the fast evolving security environment. They are interlinked, transnational, and cannot be addressed by a, one single state or one single organization alone. First, the risks and threats of an attack using chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear materials, CBRM materials, these threats are rising. The taboo against chemical weapons has been repeatedly broken in the Middle East. The use of toxic chemicals as weapons of terror against the civilian populations cannot be allowed to become the new normal. In recent years, there have been repeated warnings from the international scientific community that developments in science and technology have lowered every possible technological barrier to acquiring and using biological weapons. The West Africa Ebola outbreak was a palpable reminder of the humanitarian and health crisis a biological pathogen can unleash. A deliberate release designed to cause maximum infection could be much worse than a chemical weapons attack. Yet, there is no commensurate institutional structure or mechanisms to prevent or respond to such an eventuality. We repeatedly reminded our member states that despite much higher risk involving uh, biological uh, incidents, the in institutional investment international community has made in this area is the lowest as compared to investments made on radiological, nuclear, or chemical uh, threats and risks. We hope uh, the Biological Weapons Convention uh, Review Conference scheduled to open next week uh, will at least uh, make certain beginning to address this problem. The Nuclear Security Summit process made a significant progress in securing civilian nuclear material. Although the NSS process has concluded, but the threat remains, therefore NSS participating states decided to keep the process ongoing. Keeping this issue on the global agenda must be a continuing priority. Second, the world is experiencing a revolution in technology that is helping to drive innovation and equitable development. However, this same technology could be misused for malicious purposes with the devastating results. Our increasingly networked lives have also exposed us to new vulnerabilities. These will only increase as we move towards an internet of the things, where actions in cyberspace could have destructive consequences in the physical world, the world we are now living. A cyber attack on critical infrastructure or in a nightmare scenario, a nuclear or chemical facility is becoming a real prospect that must be actively guarded against. The international community of states is behind the curve, unfortunately. We live in a cyber age, but we have yet to develop the rules of the road that will ensure cyberspace is only used for peaceful purposes. New technologies such as unmanned vehicles and artificial intelligence are also changing the face of war. Our rules-based international order requires a better understanding of how these new technologies should be governed to ensure compliance with international law 
in particular international humanitarian law. Finally, vicious non-state actors without any regard for human life have taken advantage of our global society's open borders to wreak havoc. From Mosul to the streets of Paris and Brussels, the global illicit trade in weapons fuels these groups' carnage and allows them to menace the most vulnerable elements of our communities. Alarmingly, they continue to actively seek all kinds of chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear material. This nexus of global challenges requires that all key players to work together to overcome them. Their global nature requires a global response. Divides must be bridged and differences overcome if we are to hold the perpetrators accountable for the despicable use of chemical weapons or if we are to create robust mechanisms that will protect us from and, if necessary, respond to a biological incident or if we are to fill the normative gap when it comes not just to cyberspace but also outer space and to regulate those new technologies disrupting the status quo. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we often heard that security is a prerequisite for disarmament. But progress in disarmament has its own contributions to make in strengthening security. It does so by constraining military spending, limiting the arms trade to volatile areas, reversing and preventing arms races, and building trust and confidences in a world in which weapons of mass destruction have no legitimate place. As Secretary General Ban said in Reykjavik last month on the occasion of the 30th anniversary of the historic summit, he said, quote, some may claim that security conditions today are not ripe for the pursuit of further nuclear disarmament. I say this view has it completely backwards. The pursuit of arms control and disarmament is precisely how we can break the tension and reduce conflicts, end of quote. The recent debate regarding the proposed prohibition treaty has raised fundamental questions from both sides of the pants. I do recognize key drivers of both camps in this room. <laughs> and through this debate, a number of uh, fundamental questions have been raised. But I want to say we, I, we identify the two key questions. The first question is how will the path be charted from a prohibition treaty to the actual elimination of all nuclear weapons? Second key question is why has it proven more difficult to delegitimize nuclear weapons compared to all other weapons of mass destruction. Humanity deserves answers to these fundamental questions, and this requires inclusive engagement by all states, because all states agree to the destination of a world free of nuclear weapons, but still, we have differences on, on the methodology, how to get there. And this fundamental question cannot be solved if all member states do not engage with one another in a common effort to find a solution. This is my plea to EU member states and 
indeed to all member states to find a way to catalyze inclusive engagement. I remain hopeful that the member states of this great European Union will continue to perform their characteristic bridge building role, a pivotal European role in seeking to reconcile such differences, finding common ground, striking reasonable compromises, and building mutual trust and confidence can only be performed through active engagement. If, and as I said, 2016 has been a year of many anniversaries, I hope that 2017 will be a year of action. If this is to be the case, Europe's bridge building is needed now more than ever before. I thank you so much. Thank you, High Representative Kim. Uh, you've graciously agreed to um, engage in some give and take uh, with the uh, givers uh, for the drivers uh, on both sides of the uh, disarmament debate and other issues. Uh, maybe I could start off the, uh, the questioning and comments with a question about North Korea. Uh, you've, as you've said, the uh, United Nations uh, wants to leave the door open. Uh, last year at this, uh, in November, um, Secretary General uh, wanted to visit uh, North Korea, and there was news uh, uh, that he might be going there, but I guess there wasn't uh, receptivity or something fell through. But do you, do you see any prospects for, for the door actually being open, for somebody else being at the other side of a, of a, of a conversation? <laughs> of course, <clears throat> the, as uh, High Representative Mogherini said, uh, the resolving non-proliferation challenges through diplomacy is the best way forward. And we hope uh, that uh, will be and can be emulated uh, uh, in addressing the challenges uh, we have on, on DPRK. And when uh, Secretary General has been saying uh, he is willing uh, to play any role if it is helpful to resolve this uh, uh, challenge. He always says that his role is complementary to the roles played by the directly concerned parties, in this case, it, which is six parties. But uh, he always emphasize his willingness to play any role uh, if his personal engagement can help the six parties' efforts to resolve uh, these challenges. But unfortunately, uh, such conditions uh, did not prove to exist, and uh, that uh, prevented uh, him uh, even uh, proceeding with uh, the visit, and un until and unless such conditions are right, uh, such a visit uh, will not be productive. So that those are the <laughs> parameters in which he has considered uh, his role very carefully. But although uh, he repeatedly made it clear that uh, for him, uh, all options are open, and uh, he's ready to play any role. And uh, I hope uh, that same spirit uh, also uh, will be uh, taken over by his uh, successor as well, because that's the role uh, UN Secretary General must play, trying to uh, help uh, the directly concerned parties uh, resolve their differences through diplomacy. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Kim. Uh, I recognize, uh, I can't see everybody in the audience, so now I see a bunch of hands. Uh, Tariq Rauf, uh, first of all. Thank you very much, Tariq Rauf from Cipri. 
Uh, hi, Representative Kim Wonsu. Thank you very much for your very interesting uh, statement. Uh, recently, the Director of National Intelligence in the United States, James Clapper, said that denuclearization in North Korea is a lost cause. And I was wondering whether you might have some comments on that and what might be the way forward. And I was wondering whether uh, Ambassador Yasek Belisa might also wish to comment on that. Thank you. <laughs> so, <laughs> we're, we're getting the uh, difficult questions up first. Uh, <laughs> what, please. Um, the, well, I would take, interpret uh, what is said as a kind of disappointment. But uh, to me and also to all of us in disarmament community, and I'm sure that uh, most of Koreans uh, share this view that uh, the denuclearization should be the ultimate path, path toward peace and security on the Korean Peninsula because the denuclearization is doubted, then we may, we'll have a strategic nightmare scenario developing in East Asia. And then uh, it may lead maybe the beginning of real uh, weakening of the MPT regime worldwide. So uh, in realistic terms, whether it is achievable anytime soon, I share his assessment. But as a goal, preferred goal, from peace and security on the Korean Peninsula and in the region, and also from global non-proliferation non uh, regime, denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula should remain as the priority for the region, but also for the whole world. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, I mean, the answering the, the question directly, I, I don't believe it's a lost cause. It might be a much more challenging cause than before. It might be a more longer term cause, but uh, I think you know, as we are here in this room, we have seen, or most of us have seen, amazing changes in international security environment here in Europe, uh, in, uh, in other continents. Uh, so things which we do not imagine possible uh, now uh, can happen. Um, the, the EU's approach is to deal with the root causes of insecurity, and which, which feed into the demand for more weapons and so on. So uh, it's challenging, but, but I don't think we should, we should give up. And the EU's approach is exactly as um, has been mentioned already by the High Representative, is that we combine sanctions with an offer of, of dialogue. And this is how uh, other issues have been resolved. And, you know, at one point, I'm confident this issue can also be resolved. Okay. Thank you, Yasek. Uh, Rizwana Abbasi. Thank you very much, Mark, for giving me this opportunity. Um, I would say that I very strongly agree with uh, Federica Mogheni and Mr. Kim's very strong message on multilateral approach. Um, I would say that it proves that Professor Woodrow Wilson's approach prevails and holds sustainable grounds in the contemporary international world order. Um, I would actually endorse similar kind of spirit in our part of the world in South Asia. I would say that this multilateral approach can help us addressing and understanding issues between India and Pakistan, the two nuclear weapon states, and mitigate emerging risks. For example, number one, to understand and stabilize deterrence, deterrence that works in South Asia, but it is unstable and peace remains immensely fragile. Number two, to address and constrain arms race and actually uh, extensive arms buildup in blue waters and blue seas. 
and thirdly, to understand and manage conflict between these two nuclear weapon states, and fourth, to facilitate bilateral constructive dialogue between two countries, and finally, instituting an arms control mechanism, thereby linking it with the international paradigm. My another question would um, uh, relate to I might wanna very shorten. precisely would relate to cyber uh, threats. Would Mr. Kim, uh, you like to demonstrate on understanding cyber threats? Are we ready to institute a new mechanism like NSS after its successful conclusion to probably generate awareness, understand such kind of threats, and then prepare states, get ready to bounce back? Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> on cyber, um, ITU uh, and UNESCO is leading uh, the international debate as regards the peaceful uses of cyberspace. The, my office, Office for Disarmament Affairs, is leading the effort to deal with the potentially non-peaceful aspects of uh, cyberspace use. And uh, this debate has not been easy. Uh, we have spent the uh, last 10 years uh, by uh, forming a small group of governmental experts. We started from 15, and now we increased to 25. And I wanted to go even higher because Cybersecurity, I believe, now almost all member states recognize as the issue of today and issue of tomorrow. Because we, we are increasingly connected, and if anything goes wrong in cyberspace, uh, it will disrupt human rights very seriously and a wider scale. So it is recognized as one of the asymmetrical threats the entire humanity is facing. But still, we have a device in how to deal with this threat, whether uh, privacy, freedom of expression should be given priority over state control for security reasons, but still uh, we are able to move uh, forward in identifying what should be the uh, minimum normative denominator. But it is still too low because terrorist, violent extremists are exploiting the advancing technology. So unless we catch up and move a little ahead of the technological curve, uh, we'll never be able to beat uh, violent extremists who are misusing or abusing uh, cyberspace. And we hope uh, that the uh, last and the current, uh, the fifth uh, group of governmental experts, uh, we started uh, their discussion uh, last August. I hope it will be the last so that they can make a recommendation to whole 193 member states to start a real debate by all member states. So uh, we hope uh, this uh, group of uh, governmental experts uh, will uh, find a way to enhance the least common denominator of normative standards to a higher level, and then uh, put it uh, uh, for consideration by all member states so that uh, we can uh, find a common uh, way forward to address this crucial challenge. Thank you so much. Uh, two brief points uh, to add. Uh, <coughs> firstly, one of the important conclusions of the previous uh, GGE, which was mentioned uh, by Mr. Kim, is that international law applies to cyberspace. This opens a lot of avenues for further uh, work, further considerations, especially for the EU, which, which uh, very much uh, 
stresses the widening of, of international norms. And second point, some important work, uh, specifically on confidence building measures in cyberspace, has also been done in a major uh, regional organization, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the, the OSCE, which is very much, uh, much uh, I believe, worth uh, watching also uh, as um, you know, progressing on, on this uh, track. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I realize I'm going to run into difficulty getting to all 12 of the people who I've nodded to recognizing your uh, uh, desire to speak. Uh, I'll take about four um, uh, right now, and then we'll see where we go, starting with Bob Einhorn. Uh, thank you, Mark. Bob Einhorn from the Brookings Institution. In the Syria conflict, clearly the norm against the use of chemical weapons has seriously eroded. And I'm wondering about the adequacy of international mechanisms for enforcing uh, that norm. It took a UN Security Council resolution to establish the, this joint investigative mechanism, the OPCW and the UN, uh, with uh, the uh, authority uh, to investigate and to assign blame. Uh, they investigated blame has been assigned. The question is what will happen now? Uh, when uh, any enforcement action is subject to a veto in the uh, Security Council. So I ask Under Secretary Kim, uh, what can be done? Uh, uh, you know, are there new mechanisms, new procedures uh, that can be established, not only to ensure uh, that uh, investigations will be carried out, blame will be assigned if warranted, uh, but then enforcement action actually taken as a deterrent to the future use of chemical weapons. Thank you. If you could hold, hold an answer to that. Do you mind if I take a couple more? Yeah, sure. I'll okay, on, okay. Um, uh, Andre uh, Baklitsky, please. Thank you. Um, Your Excellencies, this was a Andre Baklitsky, Peer Center, Moscow. So when we're talking about new technologies and new challenges to international security, there seems to be two main approaches how to deal with those. It's easy to try to prohibit these new weapons or accept that they will be used anyway and uh, try to regulate them. And two clearest examples are um, conventional weapons in space and cyber weapons. With, on the one side, we have uh, the Treaty of, on Prevention of Placement of Weapons in Outer Space and uh, the proposed idea of cyber uh, treaty. And on the other hand, we have Talon Manual which is sort of trying to make sure that if there is war in cyberspace, it will be according to some kind of norms and to a less extent uh, code of conduct in outer space. So in your view, which of those two approaches is more productive? Thank you. Thank you, Andres. Um, Mahmoud Karam? No, no. In Thank you. Uh, and the Secretary Kim, uh, how would you advise the new Secretary General on how to proceed on issues related to the Middle East and particularly on a call for a conference on a weapons of mass uh, destruction? Uh, there are uh, significant changes not only in New York but uh, elsewhere and your advice in this regard is extremely important and may I remind you that, that there is a specific role that has been designed and allocated to the United Nations and to the Secretary General in a resolution in 2010. So uh, I think all the points that you have mentioned, including the dangers of uh, proliferations of components of weapons of mass destructions and what I fear most, which is the suitcase uh, scenario, uh, the fact that uh, most of these threats have come closer and closer to Europe makes this issue more and more important. So uh, I also recognize that uh, my good friend Jacek Bilica has done a great uh, deal of good work in this regard. So I too expect a very positive role from the EU. Thank you. Thank you, Mahmoud. And last in this round, um, Patricia Lewis. Thank you very much indeed, Mark, and thanks to all the panelists. Patricia Lewis from Chatham House in London. <clears throat> I'm just intrigued. Um, Mr. Kim, with your um, very thoughtful analysis, I thought, on the negotiations in 
that will take place next year that represented in Resolution L41. Um, and my question to you, which is a little bit cheeky perhaps, but I wonder if either of you would bet on how many states who, that voted against the resolution will actually show up to the negotiations starting in March. And I'll take the bet. And then a more serious question is, those countries that do so, how constructive do you think that they can be? And how do we prevent them being spoilers? And are there ways in which we can create the conditions to make this more, much more constructive going forward internationally and multilaterally? For example, ensuring that rules of consensus don't apply. I'll just throw that one in. Thank okay, you. thank you, Patricia. You know, we're on the record here, so we might get some of those uh, answers offline. Um, but uh, Mr. Kim, um, you've got four important questions. Which, which ones can you answer? Uh, the, I will answer in, in the order questions were asked. First, uh, from Bob, I mean, you are absolutely right. Uh, the, although uh, OPCW has the mandate uh, to investigate the use, whether chemical weapons or toxic chemicals as weapons have been used. So OPCW has done those jobs, but they, they don't have the authority to attribute, to identify the perpetrators. So Security Council stepped in to create a joint investigative mechanism. And uh, Jim has completed this one-year work and they submitted uh, reports identifying the perpetrators, but still, uh, not all council members were convinced. So uh, council members are still discussing about what to do. And that uh, follow-up action on the findings require the unity, in particular of Permanent Five of the Security Council. So they are still uh, discussing uh, how they will uh, follow up on the findings. First, they both time to extend the gym for 18 days. And that resolution clarified that uh, during those times, still they will continue to discuss. And we hope that, as you rightly said, the findings uh, must be followed up with the action. Otherwise, uh, it may send the wrong message to the perpetrators that uh, international community condones the impunity. So we hope uh, council members will continue to uh, show the unity in addressing this issue because there are many challenges ongoing on Syrian file, but the chemical file has been the only file all council members, P5, could agree on. And we hope uh, that unity will continue until the accountability on those uh, perpetrators uh, can be uh, addressed. Otherwise, uh, the, our, our efforts uh, for the last several years to make sure that uh, taboo against chemical weapons has been upheld uh, will not uh, lead to uh, desired outcome. So with the EU's uh, contribution and many other uh, countries' contribution, uh, we have made uh, tremendous investment in the joint investigative mechanism. We hope uh, that uh, mechanism will continue until uh, we get to uh, our desired destination of having the accountability right. So we are exactly on the same page, but I don't have the answer. <laughs> the answer is held by the five permanent members. Um, 
on, on Andre's uh, question, you're absolutely right. I mean, we, we, we are faced with uh, now so many different challenges emerging from new technologies. But I'm afraid I can give you <laughs> one size fits all <laughs> answer. Uh, and every solution dealing with different kinds of new technologies um, must be thought through depending on the nature of that technology and the implication of that technology uh, to, uh, to, to the warfare. So we hope, uh, for example, uh, the challenges we are now facing with uh, uh, killer robots, we call it uh, lethal autonomous weapons. I, I don't think uh, we can stop uh, technological advances, but we hope the international community can come up with a mechanism to ensure there will be appropriate and meaningful human control. So, uh, the, in every area, uh, we hope uh, member states uh, will start very serious uh, discourse before it becomes too late. And the unmanned uh, vehicle, whether ground, air, also will pose uh, huge challenges to us because it will amplify the consequences. As uh, shown at the last uh, Nuclear Security Summit in Washington, if cesium, sarin, or anthrax are used by terrorists, and using drones in urban areas, the consequences will be devastating. And also, we have to, we have to be prepared about growing challenge because if terrorists use unmanned vehicles, air, aerial or ground, then they will not even need the suicide bombers. And then tracing and tracking down them will be even more difficult because of the deniability. So the international community must be better prepared to address all these uh, potential uh, consequences and negative uh, implications. About uh, Mahmoud's uh, question about Middle East free zone, <laughs> I think uh, while <laughs> we have the best answer, but of course, uh, it will remain very high on the agenda of the next Secretary General because we international community cannot afford to allow this issue to bring the next MPT review cycle down again. So we must act now. And uh, uh, recently we heard uh, now uh, positive uh, uh, signs coming from League of Arab States. Uh, League of Arab States are now planning to uh, compose a 10 man, woman, wise, <laughs> wise sages council or something like that, including while. And uh, we hope uh, they will open the door for uh, engagement of the parties in the region. That includes League of Arab States, Israel, and Iran. And solutions must come from them. As you said, the UN and three co-sponsors have a role to play. But our role is to help the parties in the region find the solution. And until and unless the parties in the region are prepared to sit down with one another, and talk about the substance of the problems, we cannot find a solution. So our job is try to find a venue and modality which will allow the parties in the region to sit down together and start talking to find a real solution and addressing all the substantive differences. But still, uh, I don't think we are there yet. So we. Uh, need uh, to make uh, some extra efforts, 
So we may need talks about the talks. <laughs> so we are not there for Secretary General to send an invitation for the conference because still there are remaining differences and these differences must be addressed through the talks about the talks. We have done it uh, when we uh, try to deal with the challenges uh, in the DPRK. When we discussed the four-party talks, we held a series of uh, talks about the four-party talks and talks about six-party talks. So I think the same process is needed to address this very uh, crucial uh, challenge of Middle East uh, free zone of uh, all kinds of uh, weapons of mass destruction. On Patricia's question, I mean, of course, <laughs> I, I don't know, but the, if uh, the number of yes votes, no votes, abstentions, uh, any indicator, then uh, it, there will be the guide of how many countries will actually participate. But still, uh, I think a very serious thoughts should be given to which of the two options is better for those particularly sitting somewhere in between the fences. Whether to in participate first in the debate, try to influence the outcome to a more positive direction, and then decide about how to embrace the outcome, or even before negotiation starts, boycotting it and non-participating, and then maybe that negotiation may go even to a opposite direction. <laughs> Those uh, in the middle want to uh, see happen. So that, that will be a very crucial question. I think uh, all states, particularly those states in the middle, must ask themselves seriously which of the two options uh, will better serve their purpose. Because at the end of the day, any solution to accelerate movement to our shared destination, which is a world free of nuclear weapons. So any effort should be judged whether it will contribute constructively towards that ultimate destination. And I, I know uh, it is a tough question <laughs> for those particularly not voting for or abstaining states should ask themselves very seriously. And again, here I cannot offer an answer to each of those states. And those states must go through their uh, domestic constituencies and also uh, uh, other uh, roles uh, uh, they, they play on the international stage. And I hope uh, at the end of the day, we want to see any process of uh, nuclear disarmament will not be uh, really meaningful without inclusive participation of all states. So any efforts we hope uh, can contribute toward restoring that spirit of inclusive engagement and participation by all states ultimately, and uh, it is not a, it, uh, it, it is still very uh, uh, complex and politically charged uh, questions, but uh, that's well, the you. Our Thank you very question. much, uh, Mr. Uh, Kim wan Su, for valiantly and, uh, and frankly uh, addressing those uh, difficult questions.